Hello, David. Oh, hello. Is that, is that Ricky? It's you, this, yeah? Yes, this is Ricky. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. One of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is what you're most famous for, fortunately or unfortunately, <laughs> and that's the Highgate Vampire. Well, since you say that, it probably is unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's... Um... Unfortunately, I've always been tagged due to all the press coverage at the time about the so-called Highgate Vampire. It was covered by the press. It ended up in court at least twice and the press picked it up. And all these, all these allegations about vampires and black magic and Satanism and nude orgies, you name it, the police brought it out in court. And of course the, the press were privileged to report it, and so it got into the newspapers, and it's still being, uh, not reported, but it's still being referred to to this very day. For example, the Highgate Vampire. So when I said, well, rather you said it's unfortunate, yeah, it is, because it really, that case, the Highgate Vampire, certainly clouds a lot of other really serious investigations that I've been involved in over the years ever since. People always tend to sort of label me with the Highgate Vampire tag. And ironically, Ricky, I don't even believe in blood-sucking vampires. <laughs> That's right. I know it's funny, but it really is true. I don't. As a matter of fact, from the reports that I've come in contact with that come from you, the entity or whatever phenomenon it actually was reminds me more of reports of the Mothman in the United States with the glowing red eyes and the well, tall very dark elusive. Figure. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And not as well, a vampire I, at all. Well, no, no, I never said it was a vampire, but right. a lot of local people at the time, I, I'm going back to the late 60s, early 1970s, reported this tall, dark figure with hypnotic or glowing red eyes. A comparison was made between that and the Mothman, Sort of suggested it wasn't actually they didn't do a program but i was asked about it and my answer then as it is to you now i don't know much about the mothman because all that took place obviously in, in america was being reported also back in the late 60s as well I wasn't think, that 66 67 around that's that right or, yeah you know maybe it was fresh in in the public's mind at the time and and the uh the comparison was made this is just a comparison that i actually just made today but the, you know from what you originally described it as you never actually described it as a vampire you described it as a, something mysterious that you wanted to investigate yeah that's absolutely right i did say it was an unexplained entity i also said at the time and i'm still saying it now that it seemed to be very malignant or I don't like using the word evil because that will automatically conjures up visions of devils and vampires and things like that. But it did seem to be a very malignant sort of entity that was somehow, as we say in psychic terms, bound to the earth. It was earthbound and it kept appearing to unsuspecting witnesses in Highgate Cemetery, as I said, in the late 60s and the early 1970s. And all the reports of the witnesses were virtually the same in description, obviously allowing for human sort of interpretation and different people see things in different ways or their opinions are added to that. But as I said, it was a tall dark figure, but I suppose I... If you want me to mention that, I should really start at the beginning. After all these reports, I actually visited Highgate Cemetery back in uh, late, de um, late December 1969 after having investigated quite a few of these reports and speaking to the local, two local people that had actually experienced this so-called entity inside, mostly in or around the top gate of Highgate Cemetery in London. And the reports were very similar. I got all the details, I recorded them, I spoke to other people, and I went there to take photographs, and actually went to Highgate Cemetery one night to try and find some logical explanation that could have caused this phenomenon. Back in the late 60s, you were the president of the British Psychic and Occult Society? Oh, yeah, the, the, the actual society, the BPOS, started back in 1967. 
I mean, it wasn't that big then. It, it started out with a small group of people all interested in local ghosts, local phenomena, all that sort of thing. And it grew over the years. Um, I founded it in 1967. And uh, it was in your capacity as the president of that society that you conducted the investigations? That's right, yeah. Okay. We decided to conduct a full-scale investigation into it, or rather not a full-scale investigation at that time. I just wanted to find some... I was interviewing witnesses to try and find out what this entity was. And as I said to you, I went to the cemetery one night trying to find some logical explanation for its appearances. Because the first thing we do, and even then we did, if we embark on some psychic investigation, is to try and find out some material cause for it. And with Highgate Cemetery, there could have been quite a lot of causes. For example, there were foxes breeding in Highgate Cemetery, which there still are to this day. And I thought maybe someone spotted an animal in there, or maybe someone had seen a shadow that was been cast by the moon through the branches of a tree which was reflecting in Swain's Lane which is just outside runs alongside Highgate Cemetery I didn't know what I was looking for but I actually saw something myself near the top gate of Highgate Cemetery I, I intended to sort of go down to the main gate and climb into the cemetery and then walk back up I had a camera with me, I was trying to get some evidence of that but as I passed the top gate I did notice a tall figure out of the corner of my eye. It was very quick, and I turned around, and about, I'd say about well, two feet inside the top gate, which hadn't been used for years. It was locked. It was quite rusty. I saw a figure, and by this time, or rather before that, there'd been many local reports of this figure, as I just explained to you. And some other people came along and it got exaggerated in the reports of a vampire. And some people tried to change it and turn it into a, a blood-sucking vampire. Right. People had heard these stories. I was walking past the cemetery and I did see a figure. It was nearly as tall as the gate, which itself is about eight feet tall. But it could have been floating just above the ground. It was very difficult to say because the the actual... Oh, the bottom of the figure seemed to disappear into blackness, but I could see the top clearly highlighted against the sky. And my first reaction was, quite literally, that it's someone who's heard all these vampire stories, dressed up in a cloak, and he's trying to frighten somebody. That's my initial split-second reaction. And I looked at it, but I realized it was not a human being. It was not somebody dressed up. And it did seem to have two points of light, which I took to be its eyes. I couldn't make out a discernible face, but it was standing inside the top gate. And it was a bitterly cold night. It was late in in December, as I said, not long before Christmas. And the area had turned icy cold. It was so freezing. It, it, the temperature just changed, and I realized that there was something supernatural or preternatural there. I, I'd witnessed what other people had seen and in a matter of seconds although it seemed much longer than that it just it just wasn't there it just disappeared it was as if you suddenly or turned off a television picture it, it faded really quickly and the temperature not long after that returned to normal so going back to what you said it was after I actually witnessed it myself all those years ago that made me decided to call a meeting off the BPOS and then launch an official investigation into, well, my sighting, and I was quite satisfied what I'd seen was supernatural, and we had people in, in Highgate Cemetery in pairs, or rather in shifts, not all night, but, um, for an hour or two at a time, with cameras, trying to get some photographic evidence of the entity which had been reported having been seen and reported by the top gate. And that's how the investigation really started. <laughs> we can never explain what these things are. Mm. As I said to you, the first thing we do is look for logical explanation. I'm always very aware of human imagination, how it can see a shadow, or how even one person can see a tall, dark shape, and it can be interpreted as a monk, or even a nun, or something else. 
aware of that right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But I first became involved in this from quite a young age because I think mainly it was due to the influence of my mother who used to attend the Spiritualist Church in North London. And she was actually in very deeply involved in hypnotism and spiritualism, as I just said, and being psychically aware. I mean, it, it is a fact that even the house where I was born in Highgate, it was an old Victorian house, was reputedly haunted. And I had a couple of experiences there when I was quite young. Nothing like what I saw at Highgate Cemetery, but it was just a shadowy figure which I used to glimpse now and again. <clears throat> she seemed to or disappear th through the wall in the front room of this very old house. My mother always told me not to be frightened of these things because they can't really harm you and sometimes they don't even have intelligence. Mm. They're just reflections from the past which you can witness and sensitive people can witness more than others. But as I said, she was involved in spiritualism and um, one thing led to another but unfortunately, my mother died when I was only 13 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and her death had a, a tremendous impact on me in that it, well, it's a very long story, but it more or less shattered my life because she was one of the only people that I could confide in or she could confide in me about these things. <clears throat> my father literally just didn't understand them. He was a very down-to-earth materialistic person. Um, he was a he, he was a company director. I mean, he was a very good man. Please don't get me wrong, but he he was the complete opposite to her. He disapproved of my mother going to the meetings of the spiritualist church because, you know, when they they used to take place about eight eight o'clock in the evening, they used to go back to each other's houses for coffee and chats, and she often used to come in very late at night, and it was the cause of quite a few arguments between mum's too young to understand but I could hear them arguing and I knew it was because she'd been out late mm. she died when I was 13 and <clears throat> when I left school I sought out quite a few of the people that my mother had been associated with that being friendly with and it was from that um, only a couple of years later that I actually became involved in Wicca and that is a very ancient religion, which she explained to me, who well, I don't want to offend anybody, but it predated Christianity by many thousands of years. And I got to know the people. Um, I took quite a long period of training to become involved in it. And because there's a lot more to it than that. I mean, it's the actual... It involves the exploration of the human psyche, the human soul itself. It's not just a blind religion. Comparatively recently, in terms of time, I mean, with the early 50s, and then after that you had Alex Saunders, didn't you? That's right. I'd say that that form of Wicca is comparatively modern. I know the end thing nowadays is the swinging 60s, and you had all the different types of cults. You had the flower people, mm. you had the Scientologists, well, I mean, they're still going. There were numerous cults and sects in England. What I've always said was that Wicca, and no offence intended towards the late Gerald Gardner or Alex Saunders, but I think they more or less came along in that period of time in the 60s when there was a different era, people more liberal, and in that field, I think those two people commercialised it a lot more. That, that is Wicca. I've always said, especially in my writings, that that is not the case because Wicca goes back literally thousands of years. Um, people have condemned me for saying that and people have said to me very adamantly, I've had a few arguments over this. Well, not argue because I don't usually argue with people. I, I say something, if people don't accept it, they don't have to. I mean, Ricky, I mean, you must be aware that I've pointed this out in my writings. That the early Christian church when they tried to sort of convert, if you like, the early Britons to early Christianity, they tried to suppress the old religion 
of Wicca. And they adopted, adopted. they took over the image of the Christmas tree, for example, which was originally a fir tree, which represented in Wicca everlasting life symbolically, because obviously the leaves are always green. They took over the, the symbol of the Easter egg, which again in Wicca, very ancient Wicca, before Christianity came into being, was associated with fertility, hence the sign in Wiccan ceremonies by a literal, a physical egg. And the Christian church took it over, hence we have today's Easter egg. But a lot of these customs actually, from ancient Wicca, were adopted by the early Christian church to try and convert the populace away from the old teachings of Wicca to the new, comparatively new religion, as it was then, of Christianity. And that's the sort of thing that my mother understood and tried to explain to me in quite a lot of detail. I, I was young, I mean, she died when I was 13, but I had long t talks with her, and she just explained little things like that. And that's how I really became interested in, in Wicca. I've never actually followed a Gerald Gardner, and mm. certainly not Alex Saunders or his cults. You have to remember, when he was saying those things, he was doing it at a really sort of potent time. I mean, we're talking about the 1950s, and it was a very sensitive time because it was the sort of thing you shouldn't even talk about. I mean, well, Gerald Gardner, by this, he, he, he used to hold meetings, as far as I remember, up in up or near or Brickett Wood, which is not far from St. Albans in North London. And, of course, he caused quite a lot of controversy because he used to conduct rituals sky-clad. He got away with it, but he, he did it at a very dangerous sort of time. If he had done that maybe in the late 60s, as Alex Saunders was doing, mm -hmm. he probably wouldn't cause so much controversy. I certainly caused a lot of controversy because of accusations that were made against me, because of what I believed in, what I was trying to investigate. There's two things here. There's my involvement in an actual wicca, which I actually came to be initiated in. I, th I don't really like the word religion, even belief system. It's just an understanding of the powers in nature, in the universe, in the cosmos. And it teaches or helps people understand how these powers are or already have been still are inherent as human beings. It's part of the human psyche. It's a lot to do with consciousness and it teaches how to adjust yourself to powers outside ourselves. That's putting it really over simply. But that's what I was basically intrinsically involved in. So I had been involved in Wicca before I really took up serious psychic investigations. My psychic investigations in the formation of the BPOS, the British Psychic and Cult Society in 67, that was a sort of an offshoot of what I was doing because I realized there were so many people generally interested in ghosts. I, I really hate that word. Sorry, oh, I know. I know. It's a problematic yeah. term. And because personally, I think it's because it's so overused and diluted. And means so many different things to so many different people. That's it, exactly. That's, again, is something I've tried to point out in my writings. You know, if you say the word ghost to most people, it automatically conjures up visions of a, something in a white sheet, doesn't it? Or clanking chains, or moaning, that sort of, or carrying its head, that sort of thing. That's why I don't like the word. I believe there's many categories of unexplained phenomena. And I think these can be divided into different categories. I won't go into that now because it's quite complicated. Very basically, a lot of these apparitions that people witness are just transmissions or reflections from events in the past that have no actual intelligence. You know the old stories, stagecoaches, phantom animals, dogs, cats, even bears and that sort of thing. And people supposedly dead, some of them dressed in ancient clothing and that sort of thing. I don't think those have got any intelligence at all. I think people can witness these things under the right circumstances and at the right time and under certain conditions and witness them and automatically put, that's a ghost, it's got intelligence, it's going to harm me. I would say no to that. And that is a very large percentage of what are reported as ghosts. 
if you're talking about the Highgate vampire, and I use that word in deliberate quotes, right. Highgate vampire thing, it went wrong because back in uh, 1970, I went to Highgate Cemetery with members of my society because we intended to hold a psychic seance inside the cemetery at night to try and make communication with the entity or whatever it was. And we had a psychic medium with us, and the intention was to try and find some explanation of why it was earthbound. We wanted to make communication with it. I got arrested by the police who were keeping a watch on Highgate Cemetery because of all these vampire stories instigated by quite a few other people who had nothing to do with the official investigation. And they were keeping an eye on the cemetery, and we were arrested inside there. And I got taken to court and actually charged for being in an enclosed area with for an unlawful purpose. Now, there'd been so much damage in Highgate Cemetery. People had been going in there, smashing open coffins, putting stakes through the corpses, and oh. you name it. it. It was serious stuff. It wasn't mild vandalism, like people going in and chalking symbols on the walls or knocking flower vases over. Mm. It was heavy-duty stuff. These old Victorian vaults, quite a lot of them had been smashed open, and these vandals were going in there and breaking open the coffins and doing quite horrendous damage to the coffins and the corpses. So the police were keeping an eye on Highgate Cemetery. They caught us in there one night, and I ended up in court near Highgate, charged with vampire hunting. Vampire that hunting? That is absolutely right. Yes. Well, no, you, you can't actually be charged with vampire hunting, but that's what the police maintained my lawful purpose was. <laughs> and the only reason was because we had certain implements with us. We took to Highgate Cemetery, candles, incense, and we're in the process of making a protective circle on a small piece of flat ground up above the circle of Lebanon, where this figure had also been sighted. Mm-hmm. And I was carrying candles, incense, my portable tape recorder, and there were other people there. Some of them managed to go back to the car where it was parked at the front of the cemetery. I had an idea that if I went towards a house, which backed onto Highgate Cemetery in South Grove, their garden actually backed onto the cemetery, I could slip through their garden and just get home unnoticed. I got caught in the flashlight and a lot of the implements I was carrying, such as the candles, my portable tape recorder and some incense, I believe. And I also had a cross and stake. Now, we all had small Celtic crosses, which we wore for protection. The stake was actually engraved with, I say stake, was engraved with magical symbols and it was attached to a piece of white cord and the whole idea of that was to put the stake in the ground use a piece of cord with chalk to draw a precise circle i dumped most of the implements i was carrying on near a grave just near the back wall of the cemetery and i was arrested taken to highgate kentish town police station i refused to give my right name and address because I refused to name the other people I was with. And obviously, if I'd have given them my address, they would have gone straight back to my flat and they'd have found all the society records and they'd have got the addresses of the people. And because I wouldn't give them my address, I was kept in custody overnight and charged with being in Highgate Cemetery for an unlawful purpose. Now, when I got to the police station that night, I saw all the implements which I suddenly sort of thought I'd hidden, lined up on the desk in the police station. As I said, there's my camera, portable tape recorder, and blah, 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 and this cross and the stake. I think I had some chalk with me as well. When it went to court in the morning the next day, they wouldn't release me on bail because I'd refused to give my address, which later made the press say, David Farrant of no fixed address. It went to court, and the police only produced the stake minus the piece of white cord which had been tied to the top of it draw the circle and they produced the stake and I got interrogated at the police station they were ridiculing me half of the night saying oh you heard of this vampire then 
you know, I told them I didn't believe in vampires. It was a serious psychic investigation. We were just keeping a vigil, but they interrupted it. I refused them to people. Mm-hmm. When I came to court the next morning, the police produced a statement from myself, which I hadn't signed, to the effect that I intended to use the wooden stake to stake the king vampire of the undead after breaking open coffins to find where it rested. And I intended to stake it through the heart and then run away. That's the police evidence as it was given in court. I literally absolutely denied this and the case was adjourned. It was adjourned three times. And you know, I think it was a second or third occasion it came to court. It was quite funny actually. I can see the funny side of it now. The magistrate's name was actually Christopher Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> of course it was. But anyway, I'm, I explained to the court that the statement the police maintained I'd made was totally incorrect. I hadn't said anything like that. that all the other implements had gone missing and that I was not a vampire hunter, I was a psychic investigator. And I ended up conducting my case and I said to the the magistrate this time it was Purcell Jones he was a stripendrian magistrate I said it was just as akin for people to hunt vampires as the police are saying as for some organisations to spend vast sums of money trying to locate the Loch Ness Monster and I was acquitted because the magistrate added at the end he was quite satisfied that I could not have opened any coffins with a, a stake Right, <laughs> and um, I, I was acquitted. And anyway, the press picked it up, and all these stories got into the papers. And as I started saying to you at the beginning, because of those press reports, I was branded as a vampire hunter, and I'm not. I'm just a psychic investigator. Right. I heard of one um, vandal in particular, who um, him and some friends actually opened up one of the coffins, and. Uh, attempted to cut the head off of uh, one of the corpses. Do you know of that situation? There were quite a few people cashing in on the case at that time, yes. I know of one person who claimed that he'd located the tomb of the Highgate vampire. There were several other people who tried to cash in on my misfortunes about the vampire hunting case at the time. Some of them even claimed to have located the Highgate vampire and one of them even maintained to have staked it through the heart. How did it all turn out for you? And would you have done anything differently today than you did back then? You know, Ricky, people often ask me that. I, I don't know. To be honest with you, the answer is probably no. Because I think life is part of a learning process. Mm. It's all very fine when we all make mistakes. We look back and say, I wish I hadn't done that then. Or I'd, if it was then now, I would have acted differently. But the point is, that is how I always felt. Whatever I did, whatever I thought, was what I felt at the time. And I'd be absolute hypocrite if I said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean... I actually felt I was evolving through my experiences in Wicca and all the experiences meeting other people and the rituals, the ceremonies and all that sort of thing, trying to develop consciousness. It was all part of the learning process. Mm. And I, I, I think that's really important in sort of in spiritual development. Yeah. I completely agree with you. Um, David, it's been a real delight having come in contact with you, and uh, I really hope that you would be interested in coming back onto the show and talking about uh, some other things that I'd like yes, to talk sure, about. Yes, some other investigations. Absolutely. Apart from the Highgate vampire. Yes, apart from the Highgate. We got that, <laughs> we got that behind us now. Okay. <laughs> and we can actually talk about David and David's work. Before we um, go our separate ways for tonight... I'd like the listeners to know about some of your literature. First of all, your website is www.davidfarant.org. So two R's in Farant. Yeah. And uh, one in particular that I'm very interested in picking up is uh, Out of the Shadows. Is that your that, latest book? That's the, that's the second volume of my autobiography, yeah. Volume one came out two years back. 
that was called In the Shadow of the Hargate Vampire. And I see on this on your page on www.davidfarrant.org, and I see about 10 books that you've written here. Yeah, there would be about 10 now, yeah. Uh, which one would you recommend to my listeners? Well, as I said to you, the one you're interested in, that really gives details of my private life. If they were interested in the Highgate Vampire case as such, probably the one I wrote first of all, which is called Beyond the Highgate Vampire. Can all these books be found through Amazon? Well, I hope they are. Anyway, they should be. <laughs> and then there are also listed some DVDs. Yes, there are some DVDs too. Well, David, it's been a real delight talking to you tonight, and I hope to hear from you soon. Yeah, I'm glad we made contact at last. And have a wonderful night. I hope I didn't keep you up too late. No, no, no. That's not late for me, midnight, really. Okay. Okay, talk to it's you soon. It's nice talking to you. Good, good talking okay, to you, too. nice talking to you. Bye. Okay, bye then. The, the press were privileged to report it, and so it got into the newspapers, and it's still being... Uh, not reported, but it's still been referred to to this very day. For example, the Highgate Vampire. So when I said, well, rather you said it's unfortunate, yeah, it is, because it really, that case, the Highgate Vampire, certainly clouds a lot of other really serious investigations that I've been involved in over the years ever since. People always tend to sort of label me with the Highgate Vampire tag, and ironically, I don't even believe in blood-sucking vampires. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I know it's funny, but it really is true. I don't. As a matter of fact, from the reports that I've come in contact with that come from you, the entity or whatever... Somehow, as we say in psychic terms, bound to the earth. It was earthbound. And it kept appearing to unsuspecting witnesses in Highgate Cemetery, as I said, in the late 60s and the early 1970s. And all the reports of the witnesses were virtually the same in description, obviously allowing for human sort of interpretation and different people see things in different ways or their opinions are added to that. But as I said, it was a tall dark figure, but I suppose I if you want me to mention that, it's to really start at the beginning. After all these reports, I actually visited Highgate Cemetery back in uh, late, de um, late December 1969 after having investigated quite a few of these reports and speaking to the local, two local people that had actually experienced... Hello, David. Oh, hello. Is that, is that Ricky? It's you, this, yeah? Yes, this is Ricky. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. One of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is what you're most famous for, fortunately or unfortunately. <laughs> and that's the Highgate Vampire. Well, since you say that, it probably is unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's... Um... Unfortunately, I've always been tagged, due to all the press coverage at the time, about the so-called Highgate Vampire. It was covered by the press. It ended up in court at least twice, and the press picked it up. And all these all these allegations about vampires and black magic and Satanism and nude orgies, you name it, the police brought it out in court. And of course... The phenomenon it actually was reminds me more of reports of the Mothman in the United States with the glowing red eyes and the well, tall very dark, elusive... Was, yeah, yeah, that's it. And not as well, a vampire at all. Well, no, no. I never said it was a vampire, but right. a lot of local people at the time, I, I'm going back to the late 60s, early 1970s, reported this tall, dark figure with hypnotic or glowing red eyes. A comparison was made between that and the Mothman. It was suggested it wasn't actually, they didn't do a program, but I was asked about it. My answer then, as it is to you now, I don't know much about the Mothman because all that took place, obviously, in, in America. Was being reported also back in the late 60s as well. I Wasn't think, that 66, 67 around that's that time? That's right. Or, yeah. You know, maybe it was fresh in, in the public's mind at the time and, and the, uh, the comparison was made. This is just a comparison that I actually just made today. But, the, you know, from what you originally described it as, you never actually described it as a vampire... 
you described it as uh, something mysterious that you wanted to investigate. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I did say it was an unexplained entity. I also said at the time, and I'm still saying it now, that it seemed to be very malignant or I don't like using the word evil because that automatically conjures up visions of devils and vampires and things like that. But it did seem to be a very malignant sort of entity that was so 